welcome to the Sinners Live. Hello. Thank you very much for having me on. Your icon is amazing, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. I'm I was guessing, very proud of it. I'm guessing you're a Star Trek fan. Oh, yeah, I love it. Is yours a Mewtwo Mudkip? It is called Mewkip. Mewkip, okay. <laughs> we actually uh, tell, sell t-shirts of them. <laughs> uh, oh, really? Wow. <laughs> I'm all for crossbreeding. <laughs> See, that's what they should allow in Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Now, we do have to get one question out of the way, and I'm so sorry for this. Okay, but what's up? What's your favorite type of ice cream? Uh, vanilla with uh, Cinnamon Toast Crunch mixed in. Never had that before. It sounds S interesting. So good. <laughs> like a giant frozen bowl of breakfast and awesome. <laughs> Have you tried the chocolate with the uh, Oreo chunks inside? Uh, no, I don't think so. Who makes that? Uh, Briars, I think, has it. It's a new flavor. Gotcha. Uh, no, I don't think I've had, I don't think I've had that one. I think the one that I've mostly had from Briars is the American Dream. Hmm. If I'm thinking of the right one. Or no, I'm, I might be thinking of a completely different. I'm not even sure we have Briars down in here in Texas, to be honest with you. We mostly have Bluebell. Do you have Bluebell where you are? We do, and it's like, actually it's cheaper than Briars. Here it's oh, yeah? yeah, ice cream's really expensive in Florida. Go figure. Huh. Of course. <laughs> they don't want us to have anything cold. Not at all. You have to suffer through the heat and the mosquitoes. Oh, uh, the mosquitoes. You guys don't have mosquitoes there? Oh, we do. It's just they're not around this time of year now. They're only, they only bother us really during the summer. See, what we get around and here... We, and we don't have crocodiles or alligators. <laughs> We don't have them that much anymore. Now they all just stay in the parks. Unless there's chihuahuas around, then they automatically seem to show up out of nowhere. Of course. Oh, okay. okay. Gotcha. The chihuahua is is the is shark bait or shark bait yeah. alligator bait. <laughs> yeah, alligator basically. Bait. Some sort of am amphibian like creature, <laughs> reptile, land water monster. So started out as a weird interview. Oh no! Uh, this is this just this sounds like a normal day to me. <laughs> well, good. So um, you'll have to forgive us. A lot of our fans are stuck in limbo because our servers just crashed over at Twitch. Thank I've, you, BlizzCon. I've, I've been in limbo before. It's it's not a fun place. <laughs> so it's kind of boring. Not a lot to do in limbo. Well, you know there is that. Oh yeah, there's that video game limbo. There's not a lot to do in that one either. <laughs> I haven't played it. <laughs> now are you a gamer oh yeah heck yeah i love games Woo! our first guest that's a full-time gamer what yeah a lot of people don't have time to game apparently are you kidding me i make sure that i have time to game in fact i, I probably game more than i should <laughs> now oh, what's yeah. your favorite oh, type of life games? lifelong game do what what are your favorite type of games Oh God! Well, I've been I've been an MMO freak for years. Uh, my very first one I, uh, was uh, the original Jump Gate, and I, I got hooked on that. And then I was uh, I think I spent like four years in uh, Star Wars Galaxies, which was also a really fun experience. And then when Warcraft hit in '04, I, I I started almost I think I started like the second day after it released, and I played for. All the way up until Cataclysm, which was like seven or eight years, and then took a couple of years break, and now I'm playing again. But uh, when it comes to consoles, uh, I like first-person shooters. I like uh, I like JRPGs. Uh, I like the Final Fantasy series. I love anything like that. Uh, or uh, Chrono Crusade. Uh, I also really enjoy. I'm not much on fighter games anymore. I was a lot on. I was huge on fighters when I was a kid, but. Uh, I haven't really been into them lately, but uh, I've also I've been playing the hell out of the new Alien Isolation game. Have you played that on either the Xbox One or PS4? Uh, I've played a little bit of it on PC because I, I did a demo, and I was laughing because I played it with a friend, and by the end of the demo, he was hiding in the other room. <laughs> yeah, that game's awesome. I love it. It got really bad reviews for some reason, and I think it, I think it was mostly just because people were expecting the game to be more of like the aliens franchise games where it's you know it's you're playing as a 
as a soldier and you shoot them up and you're hunting the aliens. But no, this is more like an alien experience where it's more like a uh, what's what's a good way to put it? I like a survival simulation horror with uh, with an alien skin on it. That's a good way to put it. And you gotta love horror games when done it's right. So... They are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And this one, I think, definitely hit the mark. Now, have you tried stuff like DC Universe and Minecraft and Minecraft? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I played DC Universe for a little bit, and uh, it kind of got monotonous to me for after a while, so I just I stopped. Uh, Minecraft, I spent, I had like a two or three month period where it was all I played, and, and then I just kind of had to pull away from it, <laughs> and... Uh, I haven't really gone back lately, but I did go back when I found a uh, Attack on Titan mod that gave you, you were able to craft the ODM gear, and I wanted to be able to fly around and, and, and chop trees, you know, slice them across the neck, one hit kill. Yes, how dare those trees try to fight back. Of course, you know, they're humanity's greatest threat. You should come play Minecraft with us sometime. Okay. We promise we won't throw you off too many cliffs. Okay, I, I promise I won't destroy everything you build. No, we usually end up doing that by mistake. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> mistake? Nah, do it on purpose. Just lead a creeper into camp. Look what I found. Hey, guys, look. Can we keep him? <laughs> now, of the games that you voiced in, have you, ever, have you actually played any of them? Uh, I played Dynasty Warriors 7 when it came out. Uh... I played a little bit of the Dragon Ball Z, whatever the Dragon Ball Z game was, it came out like a year or two ago that had where you could create your own custom fighter. Uh, I played that for maybe a month or two and then kind of shelved it. Uh, and uh, I haven't had a lot of time to play Tales of Zillia. I'm only like five hours in. I'm still chasing cats and trying to pay off my debt, but I have been enjoying it. I like I'm so used to grinding in games that the the grind at the the uh, the at the early part of the game hasn't really affected me yet. But uh, I just haven't had time to play. <laughs> Sucks. Isn't it weird playing a game and going, oh, "I've only played about five hours." Yeah, it really is. Like you know, I, I used to live for like waking up as early as possible and getting no sleep so that I could play my games before I had to go to school or before I had to go to work or anything like that. But now these days, I just look forward to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Aw. Yeah. Ah, getting older, whatever. <laughs> we do have uh, one, one fan that's shouting out. AJ says, thank you for voicing Thomas in Never Ending Nightmares. Ah, oh, awesome. That game was super creepy. <laughs> it was so creepy to work on. Uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And you said AJ was the name? Yep, AJ hey, Gaming. AJ, I'm very glad that you enjoyed listening to me die horribly. <laughs> That's always a great... How does it feel going into a voice acting booth and being told, all right, you're going to play the character that's going to die? Uh, it, it It's one of the first things in the biz that <laughs> that happens, you know, especially if you're... Uh, when you first start out, you, uh, you'll usually get a whole bunch of little bit characters and stuff like that. Uh, stuff like that where playing villains or little minion characters or creatures or monsters or just random crowd people that die and uh, in fact uh, when i first started uh, the with adv films they called those sessions scream and die sessions as opposed to the the industry the usual industry term which is just walla sessions uh scream and die sessions are definitely a lot more fun with a name like that of course they'd be more fun Oh yeah, you get like four or four, like I think upwards of five or six people in the booth, depending on the size of the booth that you have, and you just you all get to scream and die together, and then you get to scream and die individually. That is such a nice way to die. I know it's like, and, and you never know, you know, one day you could die by falling into an active volcano. The next day you get asphyxiated. The next day you're choking on pocky. You know, it, it, you 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 get to really experience and experiment with a, a lot of different deaths and you and you i think after a while you s start to stop fearing death really i mean you die every day it's part of your job <laughs> what's to fear now we've got aj also asking 
What's your favorite RP- JRPG game? Final Fantasy VIII. It was the first one that I ever played, and it kind of has always been kind of one of my staples. But I don't know. Does uh, would you consider Super Mario RPG to be a JRPG? Technically. Yep. Actually, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I would say that Super Mario RPG is my favorite <laughs> RPG. That I played the hell out of that game. I loved that game, especially the music. Uh, I wish they would make another one. <laughs> Me too, and or at least. At least release it. They don't even have to do like a 3D remake. Just re-release it for like the 3DS or something. Oh, that would be so good. Seriously, like they've been doing it for so many other games lately. Like the only there, there's only two games that I want to be able to play on my 3DS, and that's Super Mario RPG and Mega Man X. That's all I want. Mega Man X, man, you like pain, don't you? Do what? You like pain with Mega Man, don't you? Oh, I can't. <laughs> Hello, Mega Man. <laughs> See, Hello. now you've just made all the guys on the stream fall in love with you. Oh, really? Wow. Rock on. Whatever. <laughs> Come on, guys. We all know Mega Man's awesome. Everybody knows <laughs> Mega Man's awesome. Hello. I hope you guys are not hearing this. I swear they're not coming for me. What did you do? I didn't do anything, I swear. Uh, have you heard about the new game from, uh, I think it's the creator of Mega Man X? Yeah, the uh, the one that he had up on, I want to say was, I don't know if it's greenlit on, on Steam or not, but I think it was, I can't remember if it was like a crowdfund or not, but uh, what's it called? It's the, because he's all, hang on, I'm going to find a picture. I actually had an article bookmarked earlier. I think it's called Mighty Number no. 9. Everyone's now yeah. yelling in the stream what it's called. Mighty number nine! Why don't you know this? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks really cool. Uh, I'm uh, Actually, the one game, one indie game that's in production right now that I've been, like, dying for the last, like, year or so is Star Citizen. That's the game that I've really been paying attention to. Uh, and that'll be, my, that'll be my return to PC gaming hardcore, other than Warcraft. Do you know anything about Star Citizen? I have heard of it. I've seen a little bit on it. It does look like it's going to be a lot of fun. I thought it was already up as a uh, as an alpha, where you could uh, buy it early on Steam. It probably is. I just don't have enough time. No. Uh-huh. Just don't have enough time. Warlords of Draenor is about to hit. Is it's hitting tomorrow? I I I have to I have to go fight. I have to go fight the Iron Horde. Have you done the beta? No, I did not do the beta. Oh, the beta was so much fun. Everyone was just dancing uh, around. I, I saw I saw clips of the last day where they unleashed like a horde of all the world bosses on everybody. Like all the all the horde leaders were attacking Stormwind and all the alliance leaders were attacking Orgrimmar or something. It was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it looked like it. It looked like chaos. Let's see. You got okay. Serp asked, "Was it difficult voicing Armin for Attack on Titan?" Uh, the most difficult part with Armin was getting that younger voice. You know, especially when he's a kid. Like I'm not even hitting it right now. Like, uh, <clears throat> that's right. I'd rather take a few lumps and brawl like a beast. Like being able to hold that that high a pitch for uh. And in like, several ep- for a couple of episodes was really hard. Like being able to to actually be the young kid. Once he once we hit the the age jump, in ep three, it, it became so much easier to play him until he started screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so, gonna lie, that voice makes me want to punch you. <laughs> oh why why? Because it it's that snotty sounding brat type voice. <laughs> <laughs> what? It, what? It's a good voice, but admit it, it sounds like that stereotypical snotty brat you'd see in cartoons. I've never thought of it as being something <laughs> like that, to be honest with you. That's how it sounds to me. I could be completely wrong. Oh, now they're right. yelling at me. How <laughs> dare I? Ah, no. Hey, to each their own. Everyone has their opinions. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, seriously. No, no, I respect that. Uh, 
I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, I have, have I ever played nasally characters? Yes, but, like, little kid Armin, yeah, it can be on the, on the cusp of being nasally, but I think normally, in, in like, normal voice, I don't think he sounds like a nasal, like, I don't think he sounds like the, the typical cartoon brat at all. No, it's just the younger version of him that kind of has oh, yeah. that to well, him. I mean, yeah, but he's, he hasn't even hit puberty yet at that point. Of course, he's going to sound he's a little bookworm. <laughs> But don't you know that's the ones you want to be bully the most? I'm kidding. <laughs> da -da -da. Uh, we've got Anime Lover asking if you could voice oh, voice Armin and Ren from K's No Stigma for me. I can't say that word. <laughs> huh? uh, let's see, like, Ren's voice was... And I'm not even sure I can actually hit the tone of Ren's voice because I did that so long ago now. My my voice has changed a little bit. I it's a it's not as clean as it was. Uh, but uh, you defeated him in the name of the Kanagi. Go back to the darkness. Uh, and then and what was the other one? Uh, that he asked. Armin, Armin okay, and Ar Ren. Armin and Ren. Uh. Let's see. What's a good arm and lion that's not going to blow the mic up? Uh, um, hmm. Let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. What was that most recent one? Uh, near the end of the series. Uh, something about battling monsters and losing your humanity. Like, ah. Uh, can't remember the exact words! No! Uh, it'll happen. I'm staring at my Armin keychain for uh, <laughs> inspiration right now. It's like, come on, man, give me, give me your words. <laughs> uh, hmm. To stand up to monsters, we have to abandon our humanity. What we fight, we become. Woo! 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 <laughs> How does it feel doing, uh, how, here's a question. How did you get into doing voice acting? Oh, uh, luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, well, I mean, I had grown up an actor. I started doing theater when I was, uh, when I was about five years old because my mother got tired of me reenacting all my favorite Star Wars scenes using her fine linen. Uh, so she put me into theater and I, you know, just, I spent, most of my childhood during especially during the summers uh doing children's theater and, and learning acting and uh it just was something that i and i had also grown up with a huge love for animation uh the disney afternoon was and uh and all the stuff that was produced in the early 90s from the steven spielberg team like the and the warner brothers uh you know animaniacs and tiny tunes uh, and anything that Disney Afternoon, especially DuckTales, Rescue Rangers, or Darkwing Duck, and all this, all those things. I, 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 I lived and breathed those, and Ninja Turtles, and Mighty Max. Uh, and uh, I also used to travel a lot over, uh, around the Midwest of the United States for some of my dad's, for my dad's art shows. And we would always listen to book on tape or audio dramas. And so, like, all, all these all these different forces and all these things that were just huge parts of my life uh, eventually just culminated in this huge interest in acting and, and cartoons. And it just ultimately came and decided, Oh yeah, well, yeah, duh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to go for voice work and then jump to my uh, junior senior year of high school. I've been anime fan for several years at that point, And I, most of my friends that were into anime were not in my hometown because I lived in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Uh, and so uh, I got, I was able to get most of my uh, anime community, like have most of my connections in the anime community through like MSN and, and Yahoo Messenger back when those were like the big things to use. And uh, a buddy of mine that went, to, uh, that lived in Austin, Texas, uh, went to high school with the girl that was the voice of Nadia in the ADV films dub of Nadia secret of blue water. And she, and he got the, the phone number for ADV films, monster Island studios division from her and then pass it on to me. And I 
just called. I, I, I emailed them and I called them uh, a number of times over the course of a few months during my senior year, the first half of my senior year of high school, and just letting them know, hey, I'm here. I'm interested. I only live about an hour and a half away from you guys, maybe two hours. I uh, just want to come down and do this. This is something I've really been wanting to try for a long time uh, and didn't get really here or anything for, for months. And then January 4th, 2004, I got my first email booking to come down and do some Walla for a show called Wedding Peach. And uh, things just started there. And within a year, I was living in Houston recording with ADV Films proper within three or four years of that I was recording with both ADV and Funimation and then about a year after that I was living in Dallas and I've been here ever since and it's, it's just it's been crazy the amount of places that I've gone and recorded and the, the number of projects sheer number of projects that I've recorded is, is far beyond anything I ever imagined I'd be able to do with this and it, it's just I still feel like I need to be slapping myself and waking up from a dream, but it, it never happens. So I'm still riding the ride. Awesome. Pure <laughs> dumb luck works sometimes. <laughs> Hell yeah, seriously. It's like, you know, and then, and then also, you know, yes, I had a really awesome opportunity come up that, that gave me a good, uh, a good doorway in, but then also came the fact that you know, like, if, if you're, if, and I, I say this, pretty much every time somebody asks about how to get into the industry themselves is that yes, who, you know, and a little bit of luck never hurts, but what really is important is being easy to work with, being able to, being able to take direction and being able to perform. I mean, and also it, it, it also helps to live where the work is, or at least very close to where the work is. So really, if you can hit those four things and then have a little bit of luck thrown in, you can make it in anything you want to do. Just have the ambition and the drive to do it. You hear that guy? Start smoothing and move to Texas. Do it. Come on, Dan. Just looks... remember, just remember, when you come down here, you're you're gonna have a lot of competition, including me. And <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Sounds like a challenge. Bring it on. You and I can go for the same girl part. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, Psycho says, oh, I'll, I'll fight you for, for the drag queens. I'll, <laughs> I'll fight you for the cross dressers. I don't know. I think you look really good in pink high heels. Oh, well, thank you, darling. It's just fabulous, aren't they? <laughs> um, Psycho says, asks, what is your top 10 favorite uh, voices that you've done so far? Top 10. Jesus. All right, hang on. Let's see. Uh, not in any particular order. I'll just. I'll just hit them as they come to mind. Uh, tai Chi from Comic Party Revolution. Kiyohei from The Wallflower. Uh, let's see. Kenichi and Kenichi the My Disciple. Uh, when ADV had it, uh, Simon and Gurren Lagann. Uh, let's see. Koichi Hayasane, Line Barrels of Iron. Akisa Shishido in Corpse Princess. Uh, Armin, uh, Luger in Tales of Zillia 2. Uh, two more. Uh, uh, you can do it. Uh, oh God. Akihisi Yoshi and Baka and Test and Sadao Mao and Devil is a Part-Timer. Woo! He did it! <laughs> yeah, boom! Um, so what, what parts would you like to play? Be it American cartoons, movies, or anime? I would like to play either deep, deep villain, like deep and very structured or layered villains, or super kooky, all over the top, high energy villains. I would also really like to play uh, any sort of like, especially American cartoons. Maybe some some sort of comic book hero would be cool. I think. I don't know. The only superheroes that I've ever really thought that maybe my voice might – or that I might be able to to really do justice is maybe Spider-Man, maybe Pierre Parker, uh, and uh, – oh, God. What was that one? I had a list of these things, and of course, now that I'm actually talking about it, they go right out the window. <laughs> uh, I'm going to blame my cat. 
you took my thoughts. I'm blaming you. Uh, what is the what was that other character? Oh, Nightcrawler. I would I'd like to give a stab at Nightcrawler. I think you play a really good Nightcrawler with the whole comic book heroes being super popular. I hope you do get a part doing a superhero. I, I think it'd be awesome. I would love to. <laughs> uh, as far as anime goes, like I would really like to play any sort of character or part in any sort of space opera. Uh, like Old Noah Zero, I really am digging that show. I've been watching it on Crunchyroll. Uh, and I would also just love to play any character in Slayers. If the, the next time they make a new Slayers, I would love to. Even if I'm just a dude, a random bandit that gets dragon slaved, I, I, I could die happy at that point. I'm not going to lie, you just won my heart. I adore Slayers. It was the actual first S anime S I got into. Slayers is my all-time <laughs> favorite anime. Uh, on my, I, I, You can't see it, but on uh, in my office right now, up on top of my collection shelf, the very my three most prized possessions are the three original releases of the original, the first season of Slayers on Laserdisc. Uh each one of them is in this gigantic, beautiful art sleeve box, or just art sleeve, and it's they're all in pristine condition. They haven't even been opened. And, like, when these things were the only way that you could get anime back in the day, it's, like, you, you would pay upwards of, like, $108, $120 a pop for these things for two episodes tops, subtitle only with no extras. And then you would have to wait six months to a year to get the next two episodes. So these first three discs uh, represent a heavy investment as an anime fan, and I love them. I will never open them. Wow, I remember getting the first three seasons on box sets were expensive because I got the original box sets, but uh -huh. you, you beat me there. And I, yeah, I mean, uh, and I, I have like at least two or three complete collections of Slayers and several different, and several different releases. But the only thing that I never really had that I never really got into with Slayers was the mangas. I, I, I've never been much of a manga reader, but uh, I do have a couple. I do have a couple of Slayer manga that I, I really enjoy. But for the most part, I'm, I'm an anime fan, and I love the music, too. All of the Slayers music, I've, I've actually been collecting the soundtracks. Uh, what about the Slayers novels? They're really good. Oh, really? I didn't know that there was novels. Yeah, they started out as novels. Uh, the mangas actually came after the novels, and I think the anime came after the novels. There's even a one where they uh, met uh, Orphan from... What? Uh, oh, yeah, crap. it's so Baby, good! I love Orphan! Oh, <laughs> uh, you're gonna have to join us for our anime Monday streams. Heck yeah. <laughs> Man, like, uh, like I actually, uh, I was really cool. I did uh, this. I was just at NecoCon in uh, Virginia this past weekend, and I, I got to do a panel that basically it was just a, the laziest panel I could think of. Uh, where I like, I, I just, I was like, I wanted to be able to show people anime that I grew up on, or the like, the anime that that I first bought when you know I, I, I had my first actual job and I started collecting, uh, like actually getting my first collection the shows that i bought that really got me into anime back in the 90s and orphan was one of them and i i brought it to the con and uh everybody in the room we all voted on the different shows that we would watch and we all ended up picking orphan and we watched the first episode and and it was it still lives up it's still so good with the exception of some of the soundtrack music is a little cheesy especially the eye catch do you remember the eye catch I do, but you gotta love the cheesiness to a point. Oh yeah, I mean, the che you're gonna get it, but the music kind of kind of threw me off. But the rest of the show, all of Orphan, like the art, the the story, and the comedy was just gold. Have you played the uh, video game? I, I played the I played the PS2 game when it was out. I don't. I'm not even sure. I have, actually no. Yes, I did beat it. I. Uh, I just remember being somewhat disappointed at first because I watched the anime first and then getting to play the game. It was a completely different cast, a completely different dub cast. And I, I, I love what David Matranga, Spike Spencer and Kelly Madison did. So 
like starting to play the game was just like, ah, oh, this is gross. I don't want to listen to these voices. <laughs> I don't want to listen to the other voices. See, I did the same thing you did, and I started up the game because I got it for Christmas one year, and I was so excited. And then I heard it, and I'm like, I looked at the game, like, did I put in the right thing? Uh huh. Yeah, that happens. The same thing happened. I remember with uh, Xeno Saga. Like, I was all about the first Xeno Saga game, and then the second one hit, and I was I I had no patience as a kid for this stuff. Like when I was a teenager, like I just heard like one or two characters sounded like they were voiced by different people than from the first game and i just rage quit and i never even like and i i just rented it so i just returned it to it and they're like yeah i don't want to play this they, they didn't keep the same cast <laughs> and i completely missed out on the rest of the story it's always sad when an anime gets a video game and the video game just isn't very good like the vampire hunter d video game i was so excited for that when i rented it and then i played uh, it, played it and it was just awful oh yeah yeah. I missed out on that. You didn't miss out on much. It was a PlayStation 1 game. Ah, uh, yeah. So everyone's telling me it's Anime Tuesday you're invited to, not Anime Mondays. Oh, okay. Monday, Tuesday. All right, so we have... The days all occur together. <laughs> <laughs> Surf Shut asked up. a question. Nobody's talking to you. You have, you've, like, I don't know what it is, but, like, both of us at some point so far in the last half hour have said something that's made my iPhone go crazy. <laughs> like, like, my, like, the phone's plugged in, and so I think it, it hears, like, it's saying, like I'm saying Siri, and then it goes nuts. <laughs> it just wants to be part of the conversation. I can help. I can answer a question for you. Or, you know, try to answer a question and send you somewhere else. Mm-hmm. See, I've got an Android, so I've got the superior one. You got the Cortana. I do enjoy, like, from what I've seen of Cortana. That seems really, really cool. But. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, Serp has a question for you. Okay, if let's there, go. If there was a second season of Kenichi, the Mightiest Warrior, would you come back and voice him? Hell yeah. <laughs> I've been waiting for that ever since they started saying, like, oh, yeah, we've made these OVAs. And, oh, yeah, we've got like four or five of them out now and oh yeah we're finally starting to release them on dvg in japan and it's been years and i'm sitting here going why haven't we licensed them yet <laughs> i want to do them yeah i would adore returning to kanichi it's something that i i think it's one of the most exciting prospects to me right now in my career is is for to be able to return to kanichi i miss the heck out of that show it was so fun and I, I, I really feel like in the years that it's been since that show, I have grown considerably both in, in as an actor and as a person. And I really would like to see how those how I've grown and how Kenichi has grown, uh, how that will play and, and how much fun it will be to step back into his skin again. Ah, I want to do it. <laughs> well, we just need to get the fans to Demand it. Go on, guys. Do go it. demand Go to it. Funimation. Demand it. Demand your Kenichi. Also, demand XXXaholic Season 2, please. Ah, there you go. Triple Xaholic. Oh, so good. I wish they would do the next part of it. Mm. I, that's an unfortunate thing that happens I, too often with a lot of anime that start off and then they never get to finish. Now, is it that they just never pick it up or they just lose the rights to it? Do you know? Well, I mean, it, it depends on, you know, the situation. Like, uh, sometimes there's just shows that are made in Japan that will never really have the, the, the pull over here in the States to, uh, to get licensed or, or the licensors may not be interested in it for a while and, or it'll just get lost among all the, 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 the bigger, more uh, mainstream titles that are being bid, bid on. Uh Usually, whenever a company has to abandon a project, it usually just means that nobody bought it. Uh, so, like, one, that's one of the reasons why Torico did not continue in terms of dub is because it just did not get the, the U.S. sales that they were hoping for, and they couldn't afford to license any more of it because they were taking a loss. Uh, so, if, if a lot of people, myself included, were very upset at the fact that we didn't get to continue with Torico because I love the heck out of that show. Uh, but, you know... Just it just happens. That's that's the way of the business. Some things make it, some things don't. 
Oh, such a shame. But what can you do? You can always yeah. see the subversion. Yeah. Yeah. Now, are there any animes... Alright, I know this probably shouldn't be something that I'm asking a vo uh, anime voice actor, but you are a fan of anime. Mm -hmm. Has there any, ever been any animes you've watched that you just can't stand? Huh. Hmm. Let's see. Not necessarily that I just can't stand the overall show, but I do have kind of a myth with my with Kazuya, my character from Freezing, because he is wholly unnecessary to the plot of that show. He really has absolutely no reason to be there. Uh, in, in fact, in most of the second season, from what I from what I've seen, uh, any time that Satellizer is actually getting into an actual full on fight with anybody, he's not even there anymore. He's he's not even there to lend support. He's not there to cast a freezing spell or anything. When the cat fight starts, he suddenly vanishes and is nowhere to be seen. And then it's all just clothes flying off and boobies. <laughs> so I'm just like, there's no point for this guy to be here. We know what they're what the point of this show is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does kind of yeah. sound like it's it's put in one direction after all. Pretty much. Ah, but hey, you know, it, it it's fun for a while. Sometimes those shows are fun. Oh, well, if you can't have fun with it, why then why do it, right? Exactly. Like I had, I had so much more fun with uh, Shido from Data Live than I did with Kazuya, because Shido actually participates and Shido actually grows as a character and Shido actually uh, has. Well, Kazuya had a moral center. He just wasn't necessarily active in the overall story, as far as I was concerned. Whereas Shido is constantly the one that's having to work for the story to progress. And, yeah. He just felt, Shido felt like a lot more more of a useful or, or complete character than, than Kazuya did. Hmm. I can't really think of any other anime that really, oh wait, I bet I can think of one. <laughs> it doesn't uh, have to be one you've voiced in, just one you might have watched. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm just, I'm looking up my shelf and just seeing if there's anything <laughs> I have up here that maybe I, but then again, I usually don't keep stuff that, that I don't, I can't stand. Uh, no, I can't really think of anything. Not right now. If I do think of something, though, I will, I will bring it back up. Alrighty. Uh, Nova asks, were there any roles you hated doing or any that were painful to perform? Kazuya and freezing. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, the only other one that I, I would call that maybe that would, I would call painful was it was a really fun role to do. It was this villain that I did uh, a little bit part. Uh, whoa. Uh, in a, in a show called 009 dash one for ADV. Uh, he was a counter spy for the Western Bloc. It was kind of like a what if the Cold War never ended? So there was all sorts of spy stuff going on, and uh, we had captured the main spy, the the, the lead female of the show, and uh, he's interrogating her. And everything that he does sounds like this. The entire hour and a half session, all I did was talk like this. Give us the plug. Give us the codes and all that stuff. Just and, and like just constantly forcing this in huge gruff force of air over my vocal cords and drying me out. I, I had to take like, I had to drink like half a bottle of water after every take just to keep myself from destroying my voice. And yeah, that was one of the most painful sessions that I've ever done. And thankfully it was only an hour and a half. The fans are saying you sound like a 60 year old chain, chain spoken woman. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh darling, don't worry about it. I'm kind of laughing because you sound like my grandmother. <laughs> Rock on. Sweet. <laughs> Versatility. <laughs> um, let's see. Psycho asks, which three characters has... Oh. Okay, this one's good. I'll give him this one. Which three characters ha have you voiced that you would like to have as a roommate? <laughs> uh, Sadal Mal. Kenichi. And Armin. 
See, you had an easy time with that one. Yeah, yeah. That just, I, I, those are the characters that I have the most fun stepping, like, uh, becoming or, or just kind of taking on those personas. And, uh, not only would it be fun to watch them interact, but it would be pretty cool to, to live with that sort of, that type of crowd. It's, I think that's a very well rounded group. So, Serp says, <laughs> so that's no for freezing vibration. <laughs> <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, guys, ask your questions. Otherwise, we're going to make them dance on. for you. This is easy. This is easy. Come on, guys. <laughs> uh, can you tell us what it's like? Uh, oops, sorry. Please tell us about the work you do called spotting and what it is huh? and what does it entail. There we go. Cool. I like that question. Uh, spotting is basically the bare grunt work uh, in preparation for ADR scripting. Uh, I only ever do spotting work for for Sentai, and that's just because they have a much different uh, they have a much different schedule progression in in how quickly they they have to move through script writing process to recording process uh, as compared to Funimation. So they have a very short time frame in which they can actually get their scripts written. So for a while, they had to use the policy of, because they were very understaffed and, and still trying to grow from uh, after the, the bankruptcy of ADV, um, be, uh, doing spotting for them wa was almost all that we could do in order to prepare the ADR scripts. And all that it entails is uh, going through the script uh, episode by episode, and making sure that all the time codes are uh, are properly marked for each one of the cues, or at least each every other cue, uh, that all the characters are properly marked, and that all foley, which is like mouth noises, grunts, screams, power up noises, laughs, whatever, is is all marked as well, and then you ship it off. And, and that's it. It's just a very bare, like, uh, at my fastest, I can spot an entire episode of a, of a show uh, in about 45 minutes to an hour. And that's it. You, you just, you go through each episode, make sure everything fits, uh, well, make sure that uh, everything is properly marked and you send it on its way. And you still do that even now? Yes, from time to time. Most of my time these days is wrapped up in uh, actual doing full actual on uh, actual ADR script writing and uh, going to conventions and recording. So I, I try to I try to take on any extra spawning work or or, actual, or any full on script work for Sentai whenever I have some extra time or whenever they have a project to give to me. Uh, and it's always fun and it's always cool because they, they I think Sentai has kind of become the art house of the anime industry these last couple of years they're getting a lot of the really beautiful really uh uh outside of the box shows uh so there's always been a, a lot of really fun projects to work on and there's a whole heck heck of a lot of fan service shows and that's that's always going to be the case <laughs> i will say i do like a lot of since Sentai came back from being ADV and stuff i do like them a little more than funimation because they don't get what's just popular cause Funimation right. seems to be doing. Right. Nothing against Funimation. <laughs> no, nothing against Funimation, and, and and really, I mean, it's just and, and Funimation also has to, on occasion, is able to get some really amazing art. You know, what I would call masterpieces or art, very art uh, artistic titles. Right. Like, case in point, uh, uh, oh my god, all of them. Oh my god, what the heck was the movie? I have both of them in my head, and now they're gone. Yay, short-term memory. Uh, I'm not clapping. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, wolf. Uh, not Spice and Wolf. No, not Spice and Wolf. wolf. Not Wolf's Rain. Oh, let's not go into that one. I love Wolf's Rain. Wolf's Rain's awesome. Uh, wolf. Oh my god, it's one of the movies. It's one of the movies that we put out. The same as uh, Sakura War, not Sakura Wars, Summer Wars. That's one of those. Summer Wars was so good. 
Summer Wars was amazing. Okay, it's the same guy who made Summer Wars that made the movie about the wolves. I just can't remember what the name of it is, and it's so good. I think it's one of Colleen Klinkenbeard's best performances of all time. She's so good. And David Matranga is in it, too, who was, who was Orphan. I think we see your fanboy showing. What? A, hey, my fanboy is always showing, baby. Uh, Wolf children? See. Wolf children! Thank you very much. Ugh, muddy mind. I cannot brain. <laughs> it's okay. We forgive you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, darling. It means a lot. Well, we're not going to make you hurt your voice by doing that too much. <laughs> um, uh, Sir asks, was, What's up, sir? Was it in a way hard to talk in the Ente Islan for Devil is a Part-Timer? Oh, my God. There, uh, there were times where it was just impossible for me to get some of those words out. But I apparently, like me, uh, apparently most of the people that had trouble with the language were the people that are considered to be, quote, unquote, veterans uh, up at the studio. So, like, me, Monica, Sabbath. Uh, we were the ones that had like the most trouble apparently doing the language while some of the newer people that were being used just it was completely easy for them. And I, I have no idea why that is. Maybe somebody should do a study. <laughs> but, you know, it's an interesting fact. But, uh, yeah, the anti Eastern language to do and to play around with was some of the most fun work that I, I've ever had in the booth. It was also some of the most frustrating. It was it was just ridiculous to try and get that out, some of those phrases out, and make them sound like an actual living language. But you did it excellently. Well, thank you very much. We we had a lot of fun with it. Jamie Markey and and uh, Chris Bevins really deserve all the credit for that because Jamie really kind of had it in her mind exactly how it should sound and really made it, wrote it out in such a way that it was very easy to follow. And and Bevins knew how to direct us in, in actually doing it. So it ended up going with kind of that, that Eastern European kind of Germanic sound. And it, it just made it so much easier. And it's only because of them that it sounds as good as it does. Now, Nova asks, and we're not sure if you can even answer this one. Have okay. any of the studios you've worked with had any policies or rules that you just didn't agree with? Hmm. None of the studios that I've worked with, but I have heard uh, of certain studios I will not name that have policies like uh, if, they're, if they're going to hire somebody to work in like production or something like that, not necessarily like acting or anything like that, but, but working in the business side, they prefer to hire people that are, that are not fans. And I, I did not agree with that. Like I, I, I know it's important, yes, to have people that are trained – in business and to have people that are trained uh, to, to be able to sell a product or to, to, to do to handle licensing and copyright and all that which is you need for these companies but to also but to just seclude anybody that has those qualifications and that training just because they're also a fan of the project I think is very foolish like ADV and Funimation both are chock full of fans both at, both on the production side and on the professionals on the uh, the business side uh, and I think that's made both the companies – I think that's the reason why both those companies have been the ones that have shined the most out of the industry over the years and, and why they, they've continued to be very successful even through a lot of the – they've both been through some really rough – from some roughy, bumpy strides. Uh, but they've come back out of them and, and they always continue to bring it back and it's because that they are also made up of fans as much as they are business people. Yeah, you would think the fans would be the ones working the hardest to see something succeed. You're right, but you know, you know, I mean, and I can I can completely understand that type of thinking. I just don't agree with it. I can understand why somebody, uh, especially like, I, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, let's say let's say the creator of the studio itself was not an anime fan. I can see how, but, but was maybe friends with people who were anime fans and they all got together and started the company. But since maybe he was the prime, like he or she would be the primary investor or the person who started the company, maybe they would not like, or, or maybe not necessarily be into the show or understand the show, but they do understand the business side and they would be more inclined to hire people that 
are similar to themselves because they feel like they'd be able to work with people like that. And, and this is pure conjecture and just a, a theory or a hypothesis or a thought experiment. But uh, I, I do think that I, I can understand how some people or somebody could reach that type of thinking. I just don't agree with it. I can see that. Yeah. So <laughs> here you go. And I'm being told not to ask that, but, Oh, I see. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. ask that question. Sorry, Nova. Which, what, which one? Oh, yeah, never mind. I guess you can't ask it. I can ask it, but you don't have to answer it. Uh, okay. Nova's asking, have you ever encountered another actor who was grossly not qualified for their role? But I don't think that should be asked. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's, it's, that any answer that I gave to that would be purely my opinion anyway. And, and it's not up to me. If, if I felt that, uh, that somebody was not right for a role but they were that they had been cast for that's not my call the direct that's the director's call they're the ones that ultimately decide whether or not they think somebody is right for a role so yeah anything that i could say would just be my opinion and i would rather not yeah Let, let's not get anyone mad at him guys <laughs> next question <laughs> Tell us about all the work you have done doing commentaries. Is it harder than doing voicing for a character? Commentaries can sometimes be some of the most intimidating and just nerve-wracking experiences because a lot of times we'll do these commentaries months after we've recorded the show or we'll do the sometimes we'll do the commentary in the middle of recording the show and and both instances can be a problem because we'll, we we obviously will have to do the commentaries before the shows have actually been released. And a lot of times the actors, because we're coming in and recording uh, and only ever getting to see the shows from our character's perspective. So sometimes we'll be playing a character that while they may be a lead or supporting lead, doesn't necessarily have a whole lot to say or to do until it's important. So you end up missing oh, all of the major points or, and all the little bitty things and all the character growth and all the, the, and all the inside jokes of, of the show. And then when you come in and do a commentary before you actually get a chance to see the whole show, you, you almost have – most of the time you have no idea like really what to say. And, and so, yeah, it can be insanely nerve-wracking. Uh, so thank God we've had the ability over the last few years to uh, be able to – go and watch the show subtitled on like the Funimation website or on their YouTube channel or on Hulu so that we can actually get a feel for the show and actually get to see the entire picture uh, while we're working at the same time. So that has helped to make doing commentaries a little more easier. But yeah, sometimes and, and sometimes you do commentaries for shows that you're, you may, may not necessarily be into, like Freezing. <laughs> I, I get the feeling that's your favorite anime of all time. Oh yeah, I love it. <laughs> all, all every day, all day, every day, freezing. <laughs> you keep your AC even freezing too, don't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's it's always freezing in here. Favorite movie is Frozen. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's oh. a different kind. I will totally go for Frozen. Oh, uh, have you seen Big Hero Six yet? No, not yet. It's good. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna check it out. So AJ asks, how do you? Uh, how do you feel that Ginoza is now an enforcer in Psychopath 2? I cannot wait to see how he's going to change in this season. He's already changed uh, a pretty fair amount since the last season, even though it might be a little subtle. But uh, getting to come back and play him, especially now that we're, we're doing it as a kind of a, as a broadcast dub, has been insanely cool. Uh, and Ginoza itself as a character, I, I, I'm really excited about playing him this season because he doesn't have that, those constraints on his emotions anymore. And so I, I think we're really going to get to see a, a whole new side of him that is, that's going to be a lot like his dad. I think we're going to see him start to become a lot more like his dad in this season. And I'm, I'm really excited to get to, to do that. Now, for those that don't know, what exactly is a broadcast dub? Uh, Funimation recently just uh, started doing uh, – they actually just started it this weekend. We're now doing a thing where as we're simulcasting certain shows, uh, prime example right now uh, would be Psychopath Season 2 and uh, 
what's the other one that they were doing? They just announced it. Uh, hang on. Foundation Broadcast Dab. Google, save me. <laughs> oh, crap. Did I say that out loud? Uh, Laughing Under the Clouds is the new show, is the other show that they're doing. Uh, so both of these shows are, are airing right now in Japan. And instead, and, and we are all, we are simulcasting the subtitle versions of these shows, which means that the, like, the day that they come out in Japan will usually have uh, an official subtitle version up for you to, for people to be able to watch for free uh, on the Funimation website or Hulu, uh, usually within 12 to 24 hours of the, th of, of the thing airing, and sometimes at the same time that it airs. Now what we're doing is also within a couple of weeks of the, the Japanese version airing, we are putting out a dub of the episode. So instead of just releasing dubs uh, in big collections that take months to produce and months to get out on the shelves... Uh, we're cutting production time. We're cutting the release time down significantly by doing by dubbing them the moment we can get a script done for the episode after it's broadcast from Japan. So you're actually we actually this last Saturday at uh, over this weekend we showed the very first episode of Psychopath season two and it only aired like two or three weeks ago in Japan. So it's super exciting and super cool. Sounds like it. It's gonna be awesome. Is it a lot of demand to do that? Like, is it very demanding uh, on you it, guys as the voices? It can be, yeah, because now we have to, in, instead of what what we've all been used to for the longest time, the last few years, is is being called sometime, but usually a few days or even a couple of weeks in advance uh, to come in and do usually an entire, an entire, uh, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Usually, like six episodes at a time, like to do our entire chunks of series at a time. Now we're being called in sometimes the day before we have to come in uh, for a, for a brand new show. Like, yeah, we need to come in tomorrow, and so it's really actually been quite cool because you get to go in, you're refreshed, you only record because you're doing it an episode at a time as opposed to like five or six episodes at a time. Uh, you really get to take the time to. Uh, play around with the words and really focus on the performance a little bit more. Uh, and since the recording sessions are only going to last for about an hour or two, depending on what the line count is, uh, like Gina's is so far, I've only, uh, the sessions that I've done so far with him for season two have only been like an hour and a half to two hours at a time and to get, to get like an episode done for him. And uh, it's been awesome because instead of spending upwards of eight or more hours in the booth and, you know, about halfway through getting really tired or just getting mentally exhausted and fatigued or starting to get crazy in the booth from being locked in a tiny room for so long. Uh, we get to go in refreshed, bang out the episode and then step out and, and uh, don't feel fatigued at all. And, and, and feel excited to get to do the next episode instead of just being exhausted from, from doing hours and hours and hours of being stuck in a little box. So it's, it's, it's been really cool. Now, does it does it kind of help you uh, connect with the character more, getting to do it episode by episode instead of just doing it in giant chunks? Yes, it, it really does because we we don't have to. Depending on how fast we have to get the show out, we we don't have to go as fast in order to to get m more stuff done. Uh, we so we do yeah we do get to take our time a little bit more with the lines and really get to. Uh, make ourselves part of the character and, instead of just, okay, line done. And, and you know, like, it's not always like we're just doing like, okay, that line done. Okay, next one, that line done, next one. No, like we, we never ha have to move that fast. But there are some times where depending on st studio time and constraints and, and budget where you do sometimes have to time crunch and that can affect performance sometimes in the end. Uh, so it, it has been really cool to, to be, do this and, and be going at a slightly slower pace Sounds like that might be the wave of the future for dubbing. I think so too. Like some some people when, when the announcement was made were saying this is a kind of a game changer, and I, I think it will prove to be. I'm I'm really hoping that it does prove to be. And and I think another thing that people should should remember too is is we kind of made the dubbing history was made with uh, Space Dandy. That's the first time ever that I can remember that a dub has premiered before the original Japanese episode has even premiered to the world. 
uh, like they they were showing those episodes of Space Dandy with the dub before the episodes in Japan were even airing. On you know, we were getting to see them over here on Toonami, and it's it, it's crazy. So like something like that, I think, is going to be the way of the future for the dubbing industry, at least when it comes to very popular titles. Hmm. I thought they were doing that with uh, Hosting Ultimate. I thought those were being released the same time in English they were in Japan. In Japan, could be wrong they, on that. They, I don't know. It's been so sure. long since Ganon's been around. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So here's something. Any funny stories from in the booth? Oh God. That you can talk uh, about. Yeah, one one of my favorite ones was uh, actually down in Houston for Sentai, and it was a couple of years ago. Uh, I had uh, stayed up late. Well, no, I hadn't stayed up late. I I had I had had to got. Wow, I talk for a living. <laughs> um, English good, yeah. English good, yes. Uh, very nice, much yes. Wow. Uh, I'm going all Sheba Doge over here. Um, okay, thoughts coming together now uh i had had to get up insanely early i think about four o'clock in the morning at uh at, from dallas and drive down to houston so i can make it there for a 10 o'clock in the morning session uh by the time i got there it was about 9 45 so it was just you know right there i was on time uh and i stopped and i got a route 44 iced tea from sonic because i was going to need the caffeine to get through this recording session uh get into the booth and it was a very, very high energy kind of zany character. And, and I, whenever I'm doing characters like that, I really get into it. And, and very often I will, uh, make very, I will get my body involved and I'll, I'll move around and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do what the characters do in order to actually like get the right sounds out. And I was just going crazy and, and flailing my arms around and, and just going nuts and I knocked my tea over in the middle of a take. And I don't think I could recreate this if I tried it a thousand times. I knocked the thing over and it landed so perfectly that it, as it fell over onto its top side, the, the straw pushed straight up and through the bottom of the cup. And so I pick it up and the bottom side and the lid is facing the floor and water and, and the tea is starting to, to pour out of the, the straw and I start and I flip it over, but then I flip it over and the end of the straw that's sticking out of the bottom of the cup is now leaking on the floor then. And so I start like wrestling with it in midair, going back and forth, back and forth and flinging tea everywhere. I hit the microphone almost. I, I Luckily, I just hit the pop screen and uh, got the f floor soaking wet, got tea all over the, the window in the booth. And uh, we just we had to halt the session. We couldn't record for nearly 20 minutes, half an hour, because uh, we had to dry up. We had to clean up the mess, and we had to replace and, and dry the microphone. So I was not allowed to bring tea into the booth ever again. And that's what got drinks banned. <laughs> yep. Uh, now no one's allowed to drink, ever. <laughs> you were that You're... bad kid in school that started all the rules, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, that would be something to see on, like, a blooper <laughs> reel. Yeah. Man, I wish we could do blooper reels more often. It would be more fun. Do you have any bloopers that you keep, like, on your computer and stuff that are really funny? No, we're not actually allowed. Uh, we normally don't get to keep any sort of uh, blooper takes. The only times we ever get to see them are if they actually make a, uh, uh, if they actually make a DVD reel or a, a reel for the DVDs. Oh. Uh my my only outtake I think that I've ever been show, uh, that I've ever had actually put on DVDs was my Lithuania outtake from uh, from uh, Hetalia. I haven't seen that one. I'll have to go look for it. Yeah, look for it. It's fun. So right. let's get into the fun topic of conventions. First, are you going to be in at any soon? Uh, yes, actually, into uh, not this coming weekend, but next weekend I'll be in Daisho Khan in Wisconsin. Fun. Hopefully you'll come yeah. to one next year in Florida. I would love to. I was act I was out there this year uh, for Florida SuperCon, and I actually, I think I might actually be. Go actually, yes, I'm going to Omni Expo next year. I'm gonna have to go there. <laughs> yeah, do it. Now, do you have any funny stories from conventions? Anything silly fans have done or had you sign? Uh, 
Yeah, the, the the funniest thing or kind of the most random thing I think that anybody's ever had me sign because they, they, they just couldn't – they didn't have anything and they couldn't find anything. So they just uh, – they were eating a banana for breakfast in line and when they got up to me, I signed their friend's stuff and they were just like, hey, sign, here, sign my banana peel. <laughs> and like, all right. I, I, if you're going to keep it, make sure to vacuum seal it. <laughs> Maybe it will keep. Have you met any of the crazy fans? I've, 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 I've met some, but like never any, like you hear in like con horror stories or the, the super crazy fan, whatever. Like I've never experienced like super crazy fan fandom. So, uh, I guess maybe it's just harder for me to get weirded out because I'm such a nerd, <laughs> but I don't know. I tend to be very open-minded too, and I'm also a fan. I, I know what it, I, I understand what it's like to when, whenever, whenever you're in a whenever you're in that type of environment, like the convention environment, and and your emotions and everything is is running so high, and your adrenaline, and you're just you're just riding all all the energy from the con that's around you, and you get to meet people that you really look up to, or you've really wanted to meet for a long time, or people you might have a star crush on, or something, and it can be intimidating. I know when I met Patrick Stewart, I might as well have have been a third grader. <laughs> like I was just like, um, I Star Trek fun, good. You are yes. Hi now. Like, I like I, I couldn't even I couldn't form words. I could not word. Uh, speaking to that man, uh, but he was he was super sweet and and you know, uh, I understand if if people are acting quote unquote crazy or what some people might consider crazy, it doesn't phase me because. We're all going to – it's like they're just excited. It's nothing to get weirded out over. Now, being a fan, have you ever worked with anyone and gone into the booth and just become completely starstruck? Uh, I kind of did when I record uh, – when I first recorded – when I recorded that Dragon Ball Z game a couple of years ago because I, I got to – you know, do all the the energetic voice for the custom characters for the for one of the games, and he got to you got to go through a storyline with your character, and you got to interact with all you know some of the DBZ greats like Vegeta and Piccolo and and Yamcha and them, and and Chris Sabat was directing me for that session, and any time I was having to do a line that was replying to Vegeta or to Piccolo or to Yamcha or to Corrin or any of those, he would do the line beforehand in the voice. And so it was like I was actually getting to play voice play uh, with with these characters that I had grown up listening to, like someone I had really loved, admired uh, and have respected his work ever since I, I, I became a fan. And it, it was it was one of the highlights of my career by far. Now, when you get to meet these people, do you ever ask for autographs? No, I've never once asked anybody for an autograph. Seems fair. Uh, huh? It seems fair. <laughs> yeah, never once. Uh, I think that might change if I ever actually meet Lisa Ortiz. We'll see. <laughs> Although, when you go to cons, you could probably do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. I just have never been to a con with her at the same time that, that she was at a con. I'm hoping that maybe that changes soon well here's hoping if we ever get her on here we'll get her to say something just for you yay i would love that oh <laughs> do it <laughs> uh we have one more question and then we'll let you go for tonight but we are going to invite you back for either some minecraft or some cards against humanity oh i'll do cards against humanity with you guys hell yeah yes we've been looking for people to do it with but you have to read your cards Oh, heck, of course I'll read my cards. <laughs> um, our last question is, ask him which voice he is in, in den ten, den, I'm sorry if I'm so, laughing in a cloudy sky. You people couldn't put the English translation first. Thank oh, you. La oh, laughing under the clouds? Yeah. Uh, I have not been cast in the show, actually. Aw. As far as, like, yet. I, you never know. Maybe there's another character down the way that maybe all I can be cast as. But as of right now, I have not been cast in the show, and I actually did not audition for it. So. Oh, well, that'll answer why. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Now, if you wouldn't mind doing a shout-out for us. Sure. If you wouldn't mind saying, and I'm sorry if I get your name wrong, your last name wrong. Uh, I, I'm Josh Garrell, and I'm a sinner. 
It's Greeley, actually. But yeah, oh, the, I'm so sorry. It's all good. I've been called Grell since I was a child. It's all good. Uh, hi, this is Josh Greeley, and I'm a sinner. Thank you so much, and I will let you know when we're going to be doing the Cards Against Humanity. And thank, thank you, you for coming. Uh, thank it, you very much. This, it was such a blast. Thanks for having me. And welcome to the Sinners. Yeah, always well. Hey, hey, I play Satan. I'm down with sin. Woo! See you <laughs> next time. Later on.